Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're just going to wait uh, for a minute or two as people come into the session. We've got lots to get through today, though, so we won't wait too long, but uh, we'll give people about a minute or so benefit of the doubt. Hello, Anthony from Melbourne. Despite my accent, which is Canadian, we're in Sydney, or I am, um, and Academy XI is an Australian company, just so you know. Okay, I think I'm gonna probably get things started because as mentioned, there's lots to go through. Um, my name is Eric uh, from Academy XI, um, welcome. Uh, before we kick off, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're gathered today, virtually, and uh, I'd like to pay respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Um, so before we get kicked into uh, the topic of today, which is human-centered design, unpacking the terminology, um, just thought I'd give you a bit of information on who we are, who Academy XI is. Um, for those of you who don't know much about us or have no idea who we are, which is entirely possible as well. Um, so we are a school for emerging disciplines. Um, so those sort of divide broadly into design and digital. So we teach both individuals and uh, teams within organizations, um, things like service design, user experience design, user interface design, um, data analytics, digital marketing, agile, um, software development uh, is just coming down the pipe, product management. Um, so the sort of total piece that we teach is quite broad and we're very focused on job role specific training. So on the individual training side, it's very much about take a UX course with Academy XI to become a UX designer. Um, on the other side, um, which is actually what I do, which is corporate and government training for teams. Um, it's either working with team leads and user experience design, et cetera, um, to upskill in specific areas, or we do a lot of mindset shift training as well, specifically in the area of human-centered design. Um, because the nice thing about human-centered design, HCD, as I'll refer to it often today, um, is that it's kind of applicable to everyone and to almost all job roles across all businesses. So um, we teach, as I mentioned, a lot of things now. Um, we started as a UX training house and we moved quickly into service design from there. Um, and broadly, the human-centered design piece is the core of what Academy XI has always done and does and will continue to do. So because of that, um, in my role specifically, I get a ton of questions around um, human-centered design, specifically around terminology um, for people who are just getting started in that space or who may know a lot about one specific area of it but have never really touched other parts. Um, so that's what today is about. It's about um, talking and unpacking um, some of the human-centered design terminology that you may have heard in your day-to-days if you're working inside a company or you may know about, but um, uh, it's kind of one of those things where you're like, I don't actually know what that means, <laughs> but I'm afraid to put my hand up in that meeting because it's embarrassing. Um, so that's what today's about, is about giving you some of that uh, base, baseline information. So um, agenda for today, um, on the next slide, I'm gonna talk to you just a bit of a caveat. This is how I describe human-centered design and some of the subcategories of it. Um, once I'm done that, we'll jump into the panel discussion with our three amazing panelists today, who I'll introduce shortly. Um, we're going to do about eight minutes with each of the three job roles that we're going to be focused on. So I'll describe that a little bit more later. And each, um, each of our panelists is going to focus on one, on one of those job roles. After that, we're going to have a bit of a group discussion around customer centricity, what that means inside their companies, because that's another buzzword you've probably heard a lot. How is that different from the other things as well? And then closing out with design thinking, what does that mean in practice? Um, and then finally, we'll have a QA. and a um, Down at the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A button and also a chat button. So the Q&A, you can throw in any questions that you have for the panel, which we will get to at the end of the session. And then in chat, anything, I guess, that's not a question um, that we'll go over at the end, um, you can throw that in there. 
So it's a lot to get through, <laughs> uh, but we can do it. So I'll move straight on to the next um, slide now. So yeah, let's start it with, again, my version of some of the high level terminology associated with human centered design. So if you look over on the right hand side, you'll see sort of the four categories that I will usually describe to clients. And those are mindsets, job roles, processes, and artifacts. So artifacts, we won't cover today just because of time. Um, and we could spend years on it. There, there will be other webinars on that though. This is just the first of many um, in the human centered design space. And going back up to the top, we have mindsets, um, which are kind of just broad ways of thinking, um, job roles, which we will uh, spend the majority of today talking to our panel about, and then processes are just more of like a step-by-step -step process that you go through um, to achieve something in the human-centered design space. Um, I'll quickly describe um, these in a bit more detail. So starting with mindsets, in my opinion, uh, or the way I describe it, human-centered design is a mindset. People have conflicting opinion a little bit on that, but I just think of it as anything, like if you are designing, creating, building a process, a product, a form, um, pretty much anything in any space, um, and thinking about the end user as you design it, that's human-centered design. It's just designing with, with the end user in mind. Super simple concept, more difficult than you would imagine to implement in practice. Um, customer centricity, also get a lot of, it's a big buzzword, you get a lot of questions about the way I describe it is taking the D out of HCD. So instead of human-centered design, it's just being human-centered. For that reason, it's kind of cool because anyone can be customer-centric in their job role, in their day-to-day -day life, either with customers or with colleagues as well. You can be customer-centric in how you deal with colleagues too. So we'll have a bit of a discussion around that towards the end. Um, job roles, the three that we're gonna talk about today are customer experience, so CX, service design and user experience. Um, I, these are kind of the big three job roles that people will do full time as like, there's no, you don't really see human centered designers as a job role title within organizations very often, it does exist. Usually there'll be one of these three or some iteration on that. Um, customer experience, the reason why it's in the biggest box is it kind of can be thought of as the biggest one. It's just the entire experience that a customer has with you as a company. Service design is a little bit smaller. It's specifically the services, like a service that's provided to that customer and then the process and the journey that um, that customer goes through with you and making sure the back end processes are set up to serve that journey so that it's good, so that service experience doesn't suck. And user experience kind of sits within that in that it's the digital touch points like a website, like a form, like an app that sit within that service journey. Um, so we'll have each of the panelists talk about their experience of each one. Um, then finally for processes, um, again, this is slightly different depending on who you talk to. I think of design thinking and describe it as a process. Um, a lot of my clients, when they come to me asking about human centered design training, they say design thinking, they mean double diamond, which is a process you go through to make things that didn't exist before. Um, and I'm actually going to get Berlin later in the session to talk about the concept of diverge and converge. Um, again, a lot of terminology to unpack, um, but diverge converge is a very simple concept that kind of sits at the heart of design thinking and the double diamond process uh, as well. So that's kind of my piece. I know there's a lot to unpack there. We'll try and uh, help you through it as we go. Um, and to help me do that, uh, I have three amazing panelists. Uh, we have Lauren, Lauren Mori, um, who is lead customer success strategist at CultureAmp. We've got Berlin Liu, um, who is a UX designer at uh, Belong, and Celeste Galtry, who is senior experience designer also at Belong. So we are going to start with Celeste, um, who is going to be tackling CX, customer experience. So I'm going to pass it over to Celeste right now. Um, as you can see now on your screen, she's going to be running through these four questions um, that will kind of give you an idea of what it's like to be a, a CXer. Okay, great. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Um, so uh, what is kind of the def uh, definition, I suppose, of a CX or, uh, role at Belong? Um, so uh, I suppose a lot of my um, job is kind of looking at different projects that kind of impact the customer experience and help uh, the teams kind of work towards building uh, a better customer experience. 
Um, we've got a, a pretty awesome um, team at Belong of CX, so we work across all parts of um, kind of the journey in different areas. Um, but I suppose a lot of a lot of our tasks are kind of um, looking at kind of unpacking the customer problem, um, whether it's kind of gathering kind of internal data or uh, running research um, to find out data or information that we don't have already, um, or kind of just working with um, the UX team to kind of look at, well, how do we start to build or deliver kind of these journeys that we're kind of looking to do. Um, we also work a lot with, I suppose, the product owners in the teams to um, ensure that we're kind of shaping the work to deliver um, a better future experience. Um, and so that we're, um, always helping kind of uh, improve on what we've got because there's, I don't think there's such a thing as the perfect customer experience. We're always learning and adapting. Um, so it's about using different tools to visualize what, kind of what we're trying to aim for, as well as getting down into, I suppose, in, um, the a some more nitty gritty of like, how would we actually go to deliver that work and how do we prioritize that um, to be delivered? Um, I suppose what my everyday looks like um, is busy, um, but uh, I suppose we've kind of, um, at Belong, we've kind of got two roles. Um, so uh, one of it is to sit in the journey teams that I mentioned before. So um, Belong's actually split up into different kind of journeys. So we've got kind of Entice, which is looking at the start of how do we get customers through the door. We've got Enter, which is about how do we make sure that they're signed up properly to begin with. Um, we get Engage, which is when the customers are actually using um, our experience. What does that look like? Um, and then support kind of sits separate to that because there's a lot of capability in terms of um, the agents and having the right tools to help them. So although it is part of the Engage um, experience, it, it is its own journey, so that's support. Um, so both uh, myself and Berlin, who's going to speak um, in a little bit, um, both sit in the entire space. So that's that kind of getting the customers to choose the right product for them and kind of um, purchase a product with Belong. Um, so a lot of my time in the squad is, uh, I suppose, helping to design and build what that looks like. Um, we're currently in the process of going into a new uh, website. So looking at how do we take what we've got now and build upon that and build a better experience as we move to that new stack. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, my job is working with the PO, um, the business analyst and the scrum master to ensure that we're breaking down the work so that uh, we're able to deliver value through the work that we're releasing um, both now and in the future and kind of prioritizing what's the most important there. Um, I suppose as well, part of that is looking to the future. So what, what would the great experience look like? Um, so um, breaking that down and articulating what that looks like, not just in Entice, but also other business initiatives. So other, other things that we're looking at from, from a brand perspective to start to look and um, evolve into. So what does that look like and how can we start to build towards that? Um, also things like creating tools to allow the business to better understand customers. Um, I suppose an example of what I mean by this is we've um, just done a project around creating some behavioral personas which help kind of personify um, our customers around a certain product um, to help us better understand who they are, why they're kind of choosing our products, um, what they're looking for when they make decisions so that when we are building, we are keeping these things in mind and delivering things that would help them. Um, I suppose uh, my, the main difference between my discipline and some of the other ones that have been mentioned, um, at Belong, um, our CX team actually work both across customer experience and service design. Um, and I think one of the main reasons for that is that um, although customer experience um, is great and super important, sometimes it can feel a bit high level or unachievable. Um, so by doing both of these roles, it helps us take a, a big vision and show how we could tangibly deliver or build towards that vision. Um, not all businesses are like that. Some people have different, a CX team and service design as separate um, paths, but um, we're quite a lean team. So that's, that's kind of why that's the case. Um, I suppose as well, as you get more experience in human centered design or um, this kind of customer centricity process, you kind of uh, start to uncover that it, it means a little less 
the different roles and it's more around the tools that you have in your toolkit. So each of these kind of disciplines come with different tools that you can use to kind of help you solve the right problem. Um, and I like to help with the definitions, I suppose, between these. Uh, I suppose it comes down to what uh, I'm accountable for in my role versus I suppose um, what Berlin will go through in a minute as a UX designer. Um, but uh, essentially kind of ensuring that we're building consistent and usable experiences across the whole business, just not just in um, certain aspects of the journey. Um, and making sure that when we're delivering those, we're looking at both the customer experience, but also those back end kind of systems. Um, also trying to kind of reduce the need for customers to call us. So where can we provide the right information um, for them to not need to answer questions up front? Um, but if they do need to answer, what channels do we have to help support them? So looking a bit holistically there. Um, also working with the product owners to make sure they're kind of prioritizing the right work um, and have a lens of the customer when they're prioritizing that work. And then working with the UX designers when we actually get to start to build towards that view. Um, and lastly, I suppose, kind of working to connect the business strategy, so the things that we want to deliver as a business, but also what we want to do as a brand and connecting that to the customer experience. So kind of trying to be the glue between those pieces so that when we're delivering an experience, it's clean, it's clear, and it's unique to, uh, I suppose, Belong's offering. Um, if, we, if I didn't exist or if our team didn't exist, what would the company lose? Um, I think we probably have a pretty janky experience. Um, we still don't get it perfect, um, even with kind of CX, but I think without uh, a CX team, although I would say our business is quite customer centric, it, I'm, I'm not sure they would know how to take that forward. So it's kind of the difference between ambition and doing. Um, so they have an ambition to look for the customer, but um, without CX, I'm not sure they would know how to break that down to deliver it. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Question. Thank you so much, Celeste. That's awesome. Um, I think it's, I think one thing, yeah, that was really good that you pointed out. Um, that's probably a good takeaway for everyone is that these roles are all pretty blurred a lot of the time. There isn't like, yeah, like sometimes you've got a service design group, a team and a, a customer experience design team off in different parts of the business, but often they work together or there's a service designer or a service design team on a CX team, or they all kind of have all the, ro all the roles and titles in one. So there is no real fine distinction between them often. Um, so yeah, just something to think about. Um, so again, Celeste, thank you very much. I'm now going to move on to Lauren, who is going to do um, a piece on service design. Good afternoon. Good morning. I'm gonna, sorry. It's very bright where I am. Welcome to my house. I live in sunshine. You can see it coming, <laughs> so I do apologize. Uh, but thank you. Thanks so much, Eric and Celeste, for setting the scene. I think it's fantastic. I love customer experience. So just for some background, I'm Lauren Murray. I'm actually a founder of my own startup, Humphrey Co., and I'm the lead customer success strategist at Coltramp, which is an Aussie-based unicorn here out in HR Tech, uh, proudly Australian-based over in Richmond, uh, right next to Inspire9, if you ever make your way out there. Um, so for the bulk of my career, I actually spent a lot of time in innovation labs. So I actually worked at both NAB and ANC. Uh, so I've been dealing with financial services, solving all sorts of problems um, before I decided to ditch corporate life uh, and head out to the world of no 3M sticky notes. So today I'm gonna to talk about service design. Um, and I'm gonna, I, just before I hop into kind of answering these questions, I really did just wanna share a personal anecdote that hopefully adds a bit of color to the service design world. Um, and it's a story that was shared with me when very early on in my career at ANZ, there was a very senior leader who'd be working in the bank for like 20 plus years. And one day he just sadly said, he's like, oh, I just wish earlier in my career, I realized that I was a design officer. And I was like, what a strange thing to say. Like you're the lead of a big business function. Like you don't do design work. Like you don't know how to do any graphic design stuff. And it wasn't really until I started digging into service design methodology and HCD all wonderful things with design thinking that I really kind of understood where he was saying because we are all designers uh, regardless of what role you play and I think Eric put it really well like in in all parts and facets of the business we are doing design work we are organizing our 
processes and services and systems and products. Um, and we're all playing into that role. And, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, I'm pretty comfortable now saying that I'm probably also a designer. So I'm going to wear that hat. Can't do any graphic design stuff, but I really love service design so much that I teach it at the Academy at night. Uh, so, I mean, the official definition of service design, according to Wikipedia, it is just the activity of planning and organising people, infrastructure, communication and materials of the components of a service in order to improve quality and the interaction between the service provider and its users. And so I kind of subscribe to that, like service design is the organisation, it's using systems thinking, it's using a lot of design thinking methodology and tools to sell that internally as well. Um, I would broaden it to say that a lot of people consider service design to only be in relation to services. Uh, I actually think it has a really big role around products. Uh, so products and services are pretty intertwined in this day and age. A lot of your products are now digital. Um, it just depends on your interpretation on how your workplace or your organisation you live in uh, just draws a distinction. If you have a pure product or a service play, like you're pretty rare in this environment. Uh, Culture Amps, a SaaS company that's technically a product-led company, but we have a huge amount of service that goes on involved in bringing that to life in the same way that the banks do as well. Um, so not too much to kind of stretch on that official definition. Um, it's pretty much the truth. <laughs> So what does a day-to-day -day in the life of an SD actually look like? Uh, it really depends on context, which is not the best answer. But so service designers in the bank, uh, we would be doing really rich, deep research with customers, doing all sorts of ethnographic, qualitative, quantitative, going out there, stalking customers, watching them, setting up all these sorts of great interactive customer research pieces and then doing really deep experimentation as well. So doing rapid prototyping, rapid testing, making sure that we were being able to build really great personas, which Celeste touched on as well in the CX space. All of these sorts of methods and tools are, are really you know, applicable in these sorts of things. They often work in large projects or large transformation streams. And it really depends on what your day-to-day -day will be. Uh, it has to be related to the problem that you're trying to solve or the opportunity space that you're working in because the tools that you will need to use will always be different. In startup land, there's not really a thing as a service designer. It's kind of a grown-up business challenge because everyone is a service designer in a startup. We're very lean. Everyone needs to be thinking about how to bring that product and service to life by aligning organizations aligning our communications making sure enablement happens making sure that the marketing is correct it's really hands-on and we all have a big role to play in making sure that that happens uh, when we talk about lean we're talking about very small teams that have to be multidisciplinary to bring this stuff to life so it's very rare that you'd find a team of pure service designers in a small scale organization because it's often something that our very experienced designers who hopefully we can lure over to the startup land um, will have in their toolkit they'll be great at ux they'll be great at sd and they'll be thinking about cx and we're constantly intertwining the different tools and methods uh, but it is very contextual it's very hard to say what the day in your life in sd will look like and i'm sure berlin will touch on this when she talks about ux but we often find people specialize in an element about service design there might be people that are very curious about research and then they choose to specialize in that um, it might be people that are really great at doing rapid prototyping or running ideation and facilitation sessions and they choose to specialize in that uh, it's very important if you are looking for a service design role to really ask those comments, you know, questions as you're going through the process and unpack what you'll actually be doing day to day because there's a lot and lots of different interpretations based on the problem space uh, and you, you really do need to be quite flexible and adept. So what do I consider to be the difference between UX, SD and CX? Uh, Celeste got it bang on, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it really is about accountability. So again, considering contextually where you fall into the puzzle or opportunity space, if you're fortunate enough to have a CX, UX and an SD working in a team, you'll notice in the outcome, there won't be a thing that slips through. There'll be everything neatly lined up from all those elements and everything will be fully accounted for. Uh, often in the real world, things are a little bit more gray. Often when we're working, uh, particularly in NAB labs, I had a wonderful team of service designers that did everything all the way down to shaping up UX designs to make sure that we were getting it right so we could move at speed. Uh, it really is one of those versatile roles where you see those more mature designers be able to flex up and down. Um, and there's lots of space for junior people to come in and learn about when to apply certain tools and methods. Um, 
the, the main difference is, I think Celeste nailed it on the head really, but CX is that big relationship sort of piece where I always think of UX as the very small interactions um, and making sure that we've got them perfect. So if you have all three, you're definitely going to win. Um, so the final question is like, if we didn't exist, if design didn't exist in your company, what would happen and what would the company lose? Uh, very honestly, it would be like Apple before Steve Jobs came back. Like it, appreciation for the end user, a customer and environment where your product and services exist, like it's just so critical. Um, unless you're a monopoly business, it's extremely risky not considering your customers. It's extremely risky not doing things with a HCD lens um, because someone else will and someone else will happily service them and meet their needs and create a better experience and a better service and have everything neatly lined up and they'll win. So it's really important for your business to succeed that design and appreciation for humans is at the center of everything. Uh, I love service design so much that I use service design methodology in shaping up everything that I do. Uh, so at the moment, I don't have a role that's heavily service design focused, but I use that tools and methodology even to just plan my meetings and to plan sessions that we're facilitating because you can, it's so applicable to just think and operate with empathy and understanding of what you're trying to achieve. Uh, it's one of those things that really flexes quite well and it makes all the difference in your business. So I do think um, if you didn't have it, you definitely have no customers. Um, so <laughs> short but sharp and a little bit brutal, but that really is the importance of these sort of design roles. Um, so hopefully that gives you a bit of an overview of service design. I know I did speed through it because I could see questions already popping up. So we do want to get to them, um, but I might throw back to Eric now. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Lauren. That's um, yeah, really insightful. And I think for those of you listening, I mean, there'll be a number of different people kind of on the call today. Some people who are starting out in their careers in UX, CX service design. There'll be other people from companies um, looking to bring human-centered design sort of mindsets, methodologies into, um, into their companies. And for both groups, I think it's really interesting to just hear that really, yeah, when you unpack service design, it's more like a set of tools as both people said, um, and really anybody can use those tools. So just because you're not a service designer or your team aren't service designers does not mean that there are not very useful takeaways and tools that you can take um, from that. So now, last but not least, we're gonna pass on to uh, Berlin, who's gonna speak about UX. Cool, thanks, Eric. What a, what a thing to follow up from, thanks, Lauren. All right, so I'm Berlin. Um, I work with Celeste at Belong, which um, for anyone who's not in Australia, it's a telecommunications company based in Australia. Um, so we sell mobile and internet plans. That's the easiest way to um, bring that up. Um, so yes, UX. I, I've thought about this because um, I guess similar to Lauren and Celeste, if you Googled for a definition of UX, you'll get a ton of different answers. So I'll tackle one element of it. Um, UX, in the way I view it, is designing products or services with your user in mind, with the aim that you can provide a meaningful and relevant experience for them. So it designs with the user at heart, involving them in your design process. And at the end of the day, it's, it's just, it's for them, essentially, because that's how businesses operate. Um, so at the crux of it, very similar to customer experience and service design, this environment's all about people, this job's all about people, particularly with UX, which is a little bit different to service design and customer experience. It's about understanding quite granular information. So people's behaviors, their motivations, the psychology that goes behind why people do certain things with certain technologies. Um, that's essentially um, the way I look at it. Uh, UX can sometimes be described as a way to humanize technology. And I'll, I'll touch on this because Eric brought up about UX um, relating to digital touch points. Um, in Australia, which can differ elsewhere, um, UX is more often than not associated with digital work. So when you talk about a UX designer, you're automatically thinking um, a digital asset like a website or an app. And that's, and that's fine, um, but I acknowledge that in other countries, it may not be the case you can still engage with a UX designer to unpack a problem that perhaps um, its solution is not digital, it's actually something else for your customers. And you can still engage with a UX designer to deliver that outcome. Um, so I've just keep that in mind because a lot of my answers are related to digital because that is the market in Australia at the moment with UX. 
Um, something about UX I really wanted to bring up, especially with this um, group over here, um, as you're learning about the space. Um, when you think UX, you may have come across this term UI. And if you look at job roles, especially, uh, again, I only speak from an Australian perspective, um, on Seek or LinkedIn, there is always roles that say UX slash UI. And it must be really confusing. We're already speaking in acronyms, like we could do ourselves a favor by just saying what the jobs are. But I guess the way I look at it is, it's kind of like if you think back to um, traditional advertising, um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, but in advertising, uh, a very well-known duo in advertising is having your copywriter and your art designer. They work together to create an ad. Um, they both have very different strengths um, and they work together collaboratively to create an amazing product. And UX and UI are kind of similar um, in the sense that it's two jobs. Um, UI is an awesome industry. It stands for user interface uh, design, so UI designer. It focuses on the visual elements of, I guess, a digital experience. Um, so it's not about making things just pretty, but it's about creating design consistency as a user goes through a digital asset. Does it align with your branding? Does it align with your marketing? Um, are you achieving accessible color contrast? Are you using colors that make it really hard for people to read, you know? Um, font sizes, font styles, uh, touch targets, and that means, you know, um, when a button is too small for a user to press. So US, uh, UI designers look into that, and it's a skill that I respect and I definitely am not very strong in. Um, but I guess that's what something I want to keep in mind. Um, it's sometimes possible to have someone who does both UX and UI. And more often than not, it's not because they're two different um, job roles that play to different strengths and they have different deliverable outcomes, which I think Celeste and Lauren touched on. So I just thought I'd like to put that out there because um, that is a really, uh, I guess, common thing that we discuss about when it talks about, when we talk about UX as a job role and how that blends into UI and, and other, um, other terminologies. Um, what does a day look like in my life as a UX designer? So Celeste has set this up really well. So um, I work at Belong with Celeste on the same team that um, is trying to tackle the same problem space, which is about understanding how customers research and consider us as a brand. Um, so with that in mind, UX at Belong in my world is focused primarily on a digital experience. So be that of a website or an app. And because of my team, I look at the website. So um, I guess to give everyone some idea of what I do in my day to day, I work closely with my UI designer, um, uh, developers on my team, content writers on my team, producers. Um, so people who help, help us take content and make sure it's updated on the website and our stakeholders and um, anyone else in the business that needs to be involved in any work we do. So this may range from marketing to branding to sales, uh, tech support, customer support. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my interactions with the business. Um, and this may, in terms of jobs, uh, involve mapping out user flows. So understanding what a person needs to do when they go through a particular task, sketching ideas, um, you may, be familiar that UX designers work um, with wireframing and prototyping. These are just terminologies to say that we turn a bunch of sketches into something that I guess is digitalized um, and we can use that to test with customers as though it's a real website, but it's not a real website. Um, as part of my job, I help contribute um, to our design system, which is another term we use for, um, if you think about a library of design elements, um, every brand has, you know, um, like a branding guideline, if you think of it that way. Um, we are very aware that if you don't have consistency in your buttons, for example, does it make it obvious for a customer to know what is the primary call to action versus the secondary call to action. So a lot of my work is working with other people, such, my, such as our UI designers to, um, create an experience that granular um, for our customers. So it's intuitive. Um, I also work very closely with Celeste. So like we said, I, I think Celeste touched on this. Um, our roles may be separated by role titles, but we work with each other and lean into each other's work um, because HDD embodies both of our roles, if you, if you will. Um, so Celeste is a CX designer in, in our team. Um, so I assist her with things like um, high level customer research. So when we first go through a problem and we wanna explore it, I assist her with that. Uh, we do journey mappings together for our customers. Um, and she touched on this about building out behavioral mindset personas. I play a role in that. And the reason why I play a role in that is because later down the track, as we develop into uh, a solution, 
I have that knowledge, but I also make sure that that flows into what I end up designing on the screens for our customers. So there's just this consistency from the vision to the execution. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, the main difference between UX and service design and CX, um, again, I'll lean in what Lauren and Celeste mentioned about our deliverables, um, but I guess for UX, it's more granular. So CX is all about the bigger picture, service design is getting more focus on a particular service or problem space, and then UX is even more granular than that. So you've got parameters and scope to work with. Um, so CX, for example, and service design, both do research. So there's UX, but it's more scoped out. So I guess to give you some, something to hold on to is um, CX may be tasked to explore um, a problem with how our customers get support. So what is their experience like? Do they call? Do they use their live chats? What are the statistics? What are the data of showing us? Um, are we solving their problems in the first go and so forth? So they're really exploring the problem. Let's say we, through a lot of research and insights, we realize, hey, there's an opportunity to up, like upskill our live chat experience and we need to get that working amazingly so that customers stop calling us um, and self-serve as much as they can on the live chat. Now, then when I go and do research, I'm learning all about how people use live chat. Where do you expect it on the screen? How do you think it's going to work? Um, if you um, use a, an assistive technology um, to, to navigate the web, how do you engage with live chat? Is it accessible? Can you easily use it? Um, do you think it's a robot or a real person? So I still do research, but it's more granular. It's more scoped out to a particular space and with a particular outcome. Um, aside from research, um, I do a lot of user testing. So I think Lauren touched on user testing for service design as well. My user testing, because UX in this business is focused on digital, it's specific with user testing screens and flows uh, with customers. and quantifying that and also looking at the qualitative data to understand what we should do next to improve the experience. And I'll touch on improving in a sec. Um, so yeah, I think that's the main thing that's different between UX and CX and service design. If UX didn't exist in our company, um, again, I'll touch on deliverables. So at the end of the day, ideally my designs should lather up to insights that CX and service design have uncovered but with a bit more granular detail. Um, and my, like CX and service design, my work has an impact on improving the customer experience vision at where I work. Now, when you think about outputs with UX, you're likely, you're striving for a more usable, intuitive, delightful service. And I know that must be really difficult to understand because it sounds quite fluffy, but I guess what could help is um, you're trying to reduce customer complaints. You're trying to reduce negative reviews. You're trying to reduce people going, oh, I, I can't handle this forum, it's awful. Um, you're trying to reduce customer support calls and requests. You're trying to reduce um, high bounce rates. You wanna increase conversion rates. So without UX, I feel like those elements will be impacted. You will get high bounce rates, lower conversion rates, increase in customer support calls, increase in customer complaints. And it could be down to either a big vision like the CX vision, or it could be down to a button placed in the wrong spot and people are pressing the wrong thing at the wrong time and no one ever questioned it. Um, so yeah, that's my two cents. Great, thank you so much, Berlin. That's um, really interesting. It's great to kind of hear, yeah, the the big picture down to the small picture and how they all work together. Um, but even as a UX designer being granular, you still have to kind of be aware of the big picture because um, it informs what you do at a, at a sort of micro scale, which is, which is both pretty cool and also a little bit daunting at times, I think. Um, so now we're going to move on to a couple of a bit more free flowing conversations. Um, the first one is around customer centricity. So you may recall me mentioning my version of what that meant, HCD without the D, um, and just how you can be focused on the customer. And that could be an internal, that could be a colleague of yours. If you're not customer facing in your role, does not mean you can't be customer centric. So um, that's kind of how I perceive it. But what I was interested to hear from the group is, what does customer centricity mean inside your company? So um, I might just start with, with Lauren, but um, then we can all kind of riff on this for about three minutes. So we'll keep it short and sharp. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so culture is 
bigger than customer centricity, which is really lovely to be a part of. But we actually are a bit more community focused. So we exist to service both the people that use our products and services, but also the people that exist within our community. And our community is primarily HR people or anyone who is interested in making the world of work culture first. Um, so that means that we actually design experiences and services for people that don't pay us. Um, which is kind of radical, but it's a big part of our mission um, and it's a big part of the reason that Coltramp is who we are um, and why we're on that journey. So it looks like organising abilities for people to connect and share and learn. Um, customer centricity is about making sure the voice of the customer is heard in everything that we do. We bring them into the room, we think about their journeys, um, we use personas. So the term personas has been used a couple of times. Um, personas are, you know, fictional characters that are grounded in research. So from all of the research we've done with the different people we interact with, including those in our community, uh, we use personas to guide our decisions that we make as an organisation and will we serve this person? Does it solve a person, you know, this persona's problems? Um, it's all about putting them at the forefront of absolutely everything that we do and just broader than just customers. Like we, we exist for our community and we think about will this serve our community and the network we're in and will it change the world of work, um, which is a pretty radical opportunity to be part of you know is something that's making a difference for people out there so that that's kind of a lens on what it looks like at cold tramp but i'm very keen to hear about belong <laughs> yes maybe celeste did you want to jump in or berlin either way whoever whoever <laughs> unmutes it themselves. doesn't matter <laughs> we can make this like a discussion yeah i was hoping yeah, we can all let's all unmute it'll be a, an exciting experiment celeste jump on yeah, all right. I might um, touch a little bit on um, Belong and then I can talk um, a bit more broadly because uh, in my previous role, I was a bit of a consultant, so worked across this discipline um, in multiple different um, companies and organisations. But I suppose at Belong, um, what customer centricity means is I think that everyone can lean into the fact that they're trying to make a better experience for customers. Um, and I think it's about using terminology that actually really centers around what what that means for a customer so when we're doing something what does that mean for the customer and anyone can challenge that it doesn't need to just be ux or um, cx um, and i suppose that's kind of probably the next question that we're going to talk about but um, it's kind of the difference between customer centricity and hcd is anyone can be customer centric um, but hcd um, and people who, who practice hcd um, are responsible for making sure that we kind of get there. Um, so they're actually designing the things. Um, and I think there was a question in the panel that was talking about POs and the difference between POs and CX. And I think POs need to have a customer centricity when they're delivering work, but they also have a lot of other accountabilities broader than just um, delivering a good customer experience and making a product that's profitable, making sure that we're um, building it the right way, things like that. Um, so they have to wear multiple hats, whereas I suppose customer experience is focusing a bit more on what, what do we need to design to get a better customer experience. Um, I think from experience with previous roles, um, uh, customer centricity is an extremely important part to help people build human uh, for, to have teams to build solutions for customers. Um, I think in the past we've worked with organisations that didn't have a customer centric company, and it makes it very hard to deliver pieces of work that are looking at value delivered to the customer as opposed to normal, um, I suppose, measures of success, which would be reduction in um, how much time it takes someone to serve a customer or a reduction in price or um, increase in price or things like that. Um, so it, it's one of those things that's obvious, um, is sometimes put to the side, but it's actually extremely important in, in order to deliver great experiences. Great, right, thank you. And Berlin? I'm just gonna add to Celeste and Lauren for the, um, the audience here. I guess um, if you want to be more customer centric, I, it, there are some ways to get there. So I will list a few ways that you can consider. Um, so one is listening to your customers. Um, so we do research, but this is no different to listening on um, when they call us up and finding out why are they frustrated? Is there something that's bugging them? Do we see a trend? Is 80% of our calls coming in about a particular problem? Ooh, that's interesting, why? And so listening to them so we can serve them better. Um, making customers a part of your solution. So to do this, you can invite them into 
um, your design process. So when you've got a great idea um, for your business, test it out, get your customers in because you never know if it's actually going to be right for them. And if it's not right, why can you pivot, iterate, do something different so that it does meet a need? Um, take an interest in their journey. So I know we talked about journey maps and that's artifacts. And I know Eric said, we're not going to talk about artifacts, but um, <laughs> just for time, really just for time. Okay. Short. Yeah. But it's all right. But this is how you can help yourself walk into their shoes. What do they do from start to end that integrates with your brand? How do they integrate? What methods, what channels are they using and really build some empathy for them. Um, you can also get involved with um, customer interaction. So at Belong, we have a team in sales. So it sits outside of design. Um, but the sales team do this round table every um, fortnight where they listen to calls when they come through to our support agents. And we get involved to listen in on those calls because there's nothing more, there's, a, there's no shorter way to building empathy with a customer than listening to a customer call in to complain or ask for help and you feel their frustrations and you just want to make it better for them. So these are some ways that you can consider in your own business. If you want to build customer centricity, it starts with building empathy and there are many ways to build empathy. You don't need to be a designer to do any of that. Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic thing. point. And I think that was the, the big point there that I was hoping to get across what you've said perfectly, which is that customer centricity is a company-wide sort of mindset or a way of being. You could be a fairly undesign conscious company and still be amazingly customer centric if you just have a whole bunch of frontline staff that really give a crap about the customer and they, and they really want to do the best they can. So obviously having the designers helps, <laughs> but, um, but that is a baseline that everyone can meet. So um, we don't have, we're, I want to get some time for questions. So we'll run through this pretty quickly. Um, but the last piece that we wanted to talk about today was design thinking. It has been touched on a number of times. I mentioned at the beginning that I think of it as a process. That process is grounded in something called double diamond, which uses the diverge converge methodology. So Berlin, very tough one in one minute. Could you explain what diverge converge means? Sure. I'll try. Um, so to Eric's point, I am in agreement that design thinking is a process and the double diamond, which you see in front of you, is two diamonds. So double diamond is a framework. It's one framework that's put forward by the design council, design council in the UK. Um, there are other frameworks, but this is one of the more popular ones. So when we talk about diverging and converging, when you have a problem, um, the framework basically says what's best practice is to explore, di um, sorry, diverge. And so open your mind, hence the, the diamond opening, open your mind, discover as much as you can about a problem. And then when you have enough knowledge from either customer research or internal data and so forth, to start defining it, converge, refine what you understand and what that then means. And so from there, you often get different strategic directions about what to do next. And then this is the part that revol revolves around product design, but you, you diverge again and you start developing different ideas. Okay, based on our, what we understand about the problem and refined to a um, insights and strat strategy, we need to think of really different ideas to help solve the solution, uh, solve the problem because um, no one solution is always right. We need to try different ones. And then you test them, test them with real customers, figure out whether it, it works or you know, what, what can you learn from your ideas more often than not, what you think is a great idea may not be right for the customers and for insights that you may have missed. So again, when you have enough insights, you converge and you focus in on a specific solution to then deliver to a customer. So that's just a very quick snapshot of the diverging and converging of a problem space using the double diamond. Perfect. Great. Thank you. And I guess just to very quickly lend another lens to that, anyone can actually use the diverge converge methodology. Say you're a call center worker, you get a call, it's just, it's just a little, like the question is a little bit outside of business as usual. What are you gonna do? You're gonna go away, you're gonna think, what, how can I solve this problem? You go out and you do a bit of research, which often just means asking your colleagues. You go, okay, I think maybe this is the, the problem that's happening, you're converging. Then you're just going, how do I solve this? And you go out again and you ask a few people, what would be the best way to solve this problem? Then you converge again with the, the best solution. And then all of that could happen in the, in the space of five minutes you phone the customer back and you say, here's the solution I've got for you. And you've just done the double diamond really in five minutes. So it's, it's a pretty widely applicable um, concept. Um, now, I know we don't have too much time, but we could just do an open discussion about, I guess, yeah, we probably don't really have time to do it to be honest. Um, so that was double diamond and, uh, and diverge converge everybody. Um, 
Now, I think we're going to open it up to question time because we've got about 10 minutes to go. So I'm just going to pull up um, the questions. If you guys could all turn your mics on. And this is really just open season on whoever wants to ask, answer these. I will, I will ask them. Um, so some of these are from a while ago now, so it's hard to say if they'll still be around, but we've got pretty much everyone still here. So um, Matthias Granberg was asking, are the three typical job roles focused on the Australian market or which job roles pool, um, world job roles? I think you kind of answered that, Berlin, actually. Um, uh, yeah, I, I won't answer it like, like in a definite way because I haven't worked overseas, but I can definitely say from a UX perspective, you can find UX roles. But speaking of roles, I think Lauren, Celeste, can't remember who touched on this. Roles are roles. Um, there are UX strategists, UX writers, UX designers. Oh my goodness, it's, it's evolving all the time. I think what's really important is there are slight parameters, but to Lauren's point, um, you need to know what problem you want to solve. If it's down to a granular problem, um, your, you know, UX skills are stronger in that space, but if it's a really big customer experience problem and you don't really know what the answer is, a CX designer, even a service designer really plays strongly in that space. Um, so to Eric's point, it's just for the Australian market, but that's not to say it doesn't exist in other markets as well. Yep. Yeah. Cool. And um, there's a second question here that I might selfishly take myself because I'm literally answering it with a course. That was what I was working on all morning today, which is a really cool question about how does CX overlap with product management specifically, um, which is another one of our um, disciplines that XI teaches. So to me, when I was designing this course this morning, like you sort of start off like, you know, it's like an HCD course. So the beginning starts with the empathy piece, then you go into problem solving. Um, and then problem solving then kind of leads into bigger problem solving, which goes into the design thinking methodology. Then as you get towards the end of that, like the, the second diamond of the double diamond, you're getting into something called prototyping, which is basically, well, what's the thing? Like we, we think we know what problem we're gonna solve now. We think we know the solution. So what are we gonna actually build um, to solve the problem? And then when you're starting to actually build a product or a service or whatever it is, suddenly you've got this new role that plays a part, which is product management. And so you want to bring someone in. I mean, sometimes they're involved right from the very beginning of the design thinking process. Sometimes they come in a little bit later, um, but there really needs to be quite a lot of crossover. So often a product manager will work with a UXer, um, will work with almost always they'll work together, CXer as well, um, to really be the voice of the product. Um, as well as, uh, but like they, they sort of take the UXers information, feed it into like, and like reframe it for the exec team of here's what we need to build. Here's the backlog of tasks or the features that need to go into this thing. Um, they're quite good at speaking business to executive teams, whereas UXers are the ones that are really championing the users, which sometimes exec teams don't like to hear if it's expensive, basically. Um, so a product manager can fill that role and then they become more like a, pro a product manager does that and then they become more like a project manager as they move forward. Again, that's my take. Um, next question from Anthony Bertuzzi. Um, what measurable improvements has the CX team been able to deliver at Belong? Awesome. I suppose I'll take that one. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so this is an awesome question. So I'm going to answer it in two parts. So um, a lot of the stuff I spoke about today was for our new experience, which obviously hasn't launched yet. So um, hopefully soon you'll, um, I'll be able to answer this question around that. Um, but what I will um, call out here is actually um, some of the work that one of my awesome colleagues, um, Jules Fernando has done. So um, as all of you are probably aware, um, COVID happened. Um, so uh, a lot of businesses had to respond quite quickly to a lot of changes. Um, so uh, for Belong, for instance, we did have offshore um, contact centre teams um, and essentially we had to turn off um, the phones because we didn't have anyone to answer them because Manila had um, much greater lockdowns than what we experienced in Australia. Um, so the team had to really work to um, look at the current experience, which um, obviously by delivering a new experience, we know that the current one's not great. Um, so I had to look at that and look at how could we quickly uplift um, and help customers where we can really clearly communicate what's happening in terms of the 
them not being able to call us and how we're going to kind of deal with that. Um, so uh, I suppose a measurable improvement of that is we did um, see cases actually get solved. Um, the reduction in cases needing to be resolved, um, they made some decisions around um, products and what we could sell um, based on kind of how much effort it would uh, it needs from kind of an agent to support that. Um, so I suppose that's something that's a bit more um, recent that uh, we've had to measure measurably kind of improve or help um, to make sure that we're not selling a product to customers they can't get um, or having a really poor experience signing up. So Great, thank you. Um, we don't have too much time left, so I'm just going to take maybe some of the um, more uh, bite-sized questions. Apologies if I skip you. Um, just one of those things where you don't ever quite know how long a session is going to go. This is an interesting one. Um, question from Alana Arbret, I believe. Um, I've heard design thinking explained as empathize, define, ideate, prototype, test. How does this relate to Double Diamond? I was trying to type an answer during those other questions so that we could answer more questions, but it's really hard to, to contact switch. Um, <laughs> but I was already typing an answer to this, Alana. Um, if you don't mind, I'll just quickly grab it. Um, in the double diamond, the first diamond is all about focusing on designing the right thing. You don't, you want to focus on the right strategy. So in order to do that, you diverge and to your point, you empathize with your user. So you go and speak to them. You watch them, how they use your product, find out their frustrations. And then from there you define, okay, we're going to hone in on specific key pain points because this is where we'll get the most value by answering these key pain points. From there, you diverge again in the second diamond, which is all about designing the thing right. So there's differences between designing the right thing and designing the thing right. So in the second diamond where you're trying to design the thing right, um, you diverge and you ideate. So to your point, number three, ideating. So you come up with lots of ideas and you turn them into prototypes. And prototypes can either be digital or they can be paper prototypes. I once did paper prototypes when we were at NAV, when our um, laptops weren't working at some point. Uh, we had like I, I can't remember what the problem was, but we resorted to paper prototyping and that was still okay. So we put them in front of bankers to understand where would you go next and why. And the whole point of doing that is to your fifth point, testing. So you prototype in order to test, to find out if this was like a preliminary prelim version of your website or app or whatever, what would customers think and why and getting some insights out of that. And then you repeat it again until you refine it to a point that you're happy to um, deploy, if you will. Um, so the double diamond is a framework. It embodies the things that you've just spoken about. Um, they're not different from each other. They're just structured in a different way. So yeah. There's a lot of yeah, different ways to kind of reach the same kind of general flow. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Uh, I think this might be a question for Lauren. Um, I think you're on mute, maybe, Lauren. So I'll just I am, yes. So I was talking an answer. <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting good at this old thing here. Yeah. So I'm trying to type game. answers while you ask questions. <laughs> I was multitasking. Yeah. I love it. Yes. What's the question? Um, Let's go. <laughs> uh, how could I apply human centered design thinking in my company from a systems processes perspective? That sounds like a service design question. It is, but it's also just a general human question. So it's a fantastic question, Shen. Thank you for asking. Uh, HCD can be applied at all levels. It's really about using change methodology, which is another thing I have in my toolkit to work out where to get started. I mean, if you follow Cotter's seven steps, they find the sense of urgency, you create it, and then you, you're on your journey to becoming HCD. Uh, in terms of systems and processes, there's some very functional resources out there. The great thing about the design world, particularly service design, UX and CX, there's a lot of free resources online. Everyone pays it flawed. Um, there's lots of different methods. There's lots of different frameworks. So you can have a look at how you are able to bring it in. Um, but at the short, like I always start with empathy and I always lean on Cotter's framework about building a sense of urgency about why we need to demonstrate empathy and build real collective empathy across our company. Yeah, and why that's important. 100% yeah. agree. Sorry to interrupt you. I just realized no, that we're running very short of very, time. Very, very, I mean, very behind. <laughs> to me, what this all comes back to is really the empathy piece when you want to go company wide. That's the, the, where you kind of have to start. Like Celeste was saying, if you don't have customer centricity as an organization um, at a base level, you, it's really hard to be customer centric uh, or to do human centered design as a whole. You can definitely do it, but top up is, or bottom up is a lot easier than top down in some ways. So, um, thank you so much, everybody, in the last minute or so we have available for coming to this webinar. I hope it was um, 
useful to you. I, it probably answered or opened up a lot of new questions. Uh, the upside is that there's a lot more where this came from. So this is the first in a series of HCD uh, and other discipline oriented webinars. Um, the next HCD oriented webinar is on July 7th. It's a CX specific webinar. Uh, we'll be coming out with a, an email to participants um, in the next day or two with some more information on that. And we also have a agile webinar next week. So it's another one of like, like, H like HCD, um, Agile can be used in some aspect by almost any company, any team, any department. Um, so if you wanna just learn some tips for making work more human from a, an Agile coach, one of our partners, Stephen Ma, um, you can join us next week. So that'll be up on Eventbrite as well. Um, so thank you, um, three fantastic panelists. Uh, that was amazing. Um, we've stuck in pretty much the time, so I really appreciate it. And um, to everyone listening in, Thank you for attending and um, hopefully we'll see you soon. We'll send out an email with that information on the next courses shortly. Okay, that was a lot of talking, bye. <laughs> bye.